What is up in your heads? Today we're talking about the compression ratio of your engine. First, we're going to explore the theory behind compression ratio. So we're going to see what a compression ratio is and how it influences the performance and efficiency of your engine. After that, we're diving into the practical side of things and we're going to see how to calculate and how to modify compression ratios. And finally, we're going to be talking about choosing the optimal compression ratio for your application. So let's get started. Now, when we say compression ratio, we're talking about the static compression ratio of your engine. And that is the ratio between the largest and the smallest volume of your cylinder. The largest volume of your cylinder is determined by the position of the piston at bottom dead center. So when the piston is at bottom dead center, this is your largest cylinder volume. Your smallest cylinder volume occurs when your piston is at top dead center. So the compression ratio is the ratio between these two cylinder volumes. So if our largest cylinder volume when the piston is at bottom dead center is 100 cc and our smallest cylinder volume when the piston is at top dead center is 10 cc, then our compression ratio is 10 to 1. It's that simple. Now your compression ratio, as the name sort of implies, determines how much we compress the air fuel mixture inside the cylinder. The higher the compression ratio, the more we compress the mixture, and the more we compress the mixture, the closer we bring the air and fuel molecules together. Now this is especially important in a spark ignition engine, because in a spark ignition engine, combustion occurs as an evenly spreading out flame front, at least it's supposed to occur that way, and it means that the first layer that gets ignited increases the temperature of the the next layer and then combusts the next layer and so on. In other words, uh, combustion occurs in layers that spread out evenly outwards. And by bringing the air fuel molecules closer together, we facilitate the heat transfer from one layer onto the next one. In other words, we make it possible for combustion to occur more effectively and more rapidly. And by doing this, we ensure that the air fuel mixture is burned more thoroughly. In general, a higher compression ratio is achieved by reducing the size of the combustion chamber and or by somehow bringing the piston closer uh, to the combustion chamber. In both cases, we're bringing the piston closer to the heart of the combustion, to the source of the energy, and by doing this, we're allowing more of this energy to be transferred onto the piston more effectively and be turned into mechanical energy. In other words, by increasing the compression ratio, we can increase both the power output and the efficiency of the engine. So if higher compression ratios are better, we should all run infinitely high compression ratios on our engine. Well, of course not. As with all things, there is a sensible limit to a compression ratio and you can actually have too much of a good thing. Now, a higher compression ratio contributes to a more complete burning of the air fuel mixture, but this as a consequence has increased combustion temperatures. The more we compress the air fuel mixture, the better it burns and the better it burns, the hotter it burns. The upside of this is of course increased power potential and increased efficiency, but the downside is that high combustion temperatures increase nitrogen oxide emissions. This is one of the reasons why more modern diesel engines, for example the Euro 6 emissions norm, actually on average have lower compression ratios than their predecessors. But the greatest limiting factor when it comes to compression ratios in spark ignition engines is called the knock. Now when we compress gases, we bring their molecules closer together so they bounce off of each other more, which increases their friction, which increases the temperature of the gas. Now air of course is also a gas, so when we compress it, we heat it up. And in fact, if we compress the air too much inside the cylinder, we can get it so hot that it can ignite the gasoline fuel inside the cylinder before it's reached by the evenly expanding flame front initiated by the spark plug. When this happens, we have knock. In general, knock has the capacity to kill an engine pretty fast and it should always be avoided. Of course, a higher compression ratio obviously increases the chances for knock. And this is especially true for forced induction engines, which are sending already compressed air into the cylinder, uh, inevitably adding heat into the system, which means that forced induction engines are even more limited in the compression ratio that they can run. Okay, so that's the basic theory. Now let's move on to the practical side of things. What does actually determine your compression ratio? Well, it's actually seven things. Your engine bore, your stroke, the thickness of your compressed head gasket, the bore of your head gasket, the distance between your piston top and your block deck, the volume of your piston dish or dome, and the volume of your combustion chamber. Okay, so that's what determines it, but how do you calculate it? Well, of course, there's a formula and we could do it manually, but the internet allows us to be lazy instead, and we're just going to plug everything into a readily available free-to-use online compression ratio calculator like this one. Now, for the sake of the example, I'll be plugging in values from my 1.6 liter Toyota 4A FE engine, which I'm planning to turbocharge to 300 horsepower on pump gas and install into my Toyota MR2 Mark 1. 
So let's start with the engine bore. Obviously, that's the diameter of our cylinder. Now, in my case, that's 81 and a half millimeters. Now, in stock form, this engine actually has 81 millimeters of bore. However, I have overbored the engine to install oversized pistons. So now my bore is 81.5 millimeters. Our stroke is the distance that the piston covers from top to bottom dead center. And in my case, that's 77 millimeters. My head gasket bore is 83 millimeters. Now, some online compression ratio calculators actually don't have an input for your head gasket bore. Uh, in general, these calculators will assume that your head gasket bore is equal to your cylinder bore and will give you a slightly higher compression ratio value than calculators that do have this input because in general, your head gasket bore is a tiny bit larger than your cylinder bore. The thickness of my compressed head gasket is 1.4 millimeters and the volume of my combustion chambers is 36.5 cc. Finally, we have the distance between the piston top and the block deck. This is obviously measured at TDC. And if your piston protrudes above the block deck, then this value should be entered with a minus sign. If the piston is perfectly flush with the block deck, then the value is zero. And if the piston top is slightly below the block deck, then the value should be entered uh, as a positive value. In my case, the piston is just one tenth of a millimeter above the block deck. So I'm entering the value with a minus sign. Okay, once we have all the values in, we just click on calculate CR and we get our result. And as you can see, in my case, this is 8.44 to one. Now, before I explain why I went for this particular compression ratio, let's explain how to modify your compression ratio. Now, modifying an engine's static compression ratio is really easy during the engine building phase, but it's impossible to do it once the engine is assembled and running. And this is because to modify the compression ratio, we must modify the hardware that makes up the engine. Let's start with the bore and stroke of the engine. All other things being equal, increasing the bore and or stroke of the engine will increase the compression ratio. And this is because by either increasing the bore or the stroke, you're increasing the largest cylinder volume. So when the piston is at bottom dead center, while also leaving the smallest cylinder volume when the piston is at top dead center untouched. On most engines, we're pretty limited in how much we can increase the bore without major modifications. In most cases, the stock bore, the stock sleeve can be increased by around two millimeters on most engines before you run out of material between the bores to support the construction of the engine. On the other hand, stroker kits, for example, allow you to increase the engine stroke by a pretty substantial amount, as much as 10 to 15 millimeters in some cases, which leads to a pretty substantial increase in the compression ratio. The next thing we can change is, of course, the head gasket. And this is probably the most cost effective and simplest way to modify your compression ratio. Uh, by changing the thickness of the head gasket, we're changing the cylinder volume, which of course changes the compression ratio. A thicker head gasket is going to reduce the compression ratio, while a thinner head gasket is going to increase the compression ratio. But be warned, a thinner head gasket is less capable at absorbing any sort of imperfections in your block deck or your cylinder head surface. So you must ensure that everything is machined perfectly flat for a reliable seal with a very thin head gasket. Since we're speaking about machining, that too is a great and inexpensive way to modify your compression ratio. However, machining can only remove material, which means that it can only increase, it cannot decrease your compression ratio. By machining away or removing material from your block deck or your cylinder head surface, we're going to be decreasing our cylinder volume and increasing our compression ratio. The only way to modify the volume of your combustion chambers is to grind away material from within the combustion chamber, which will increase the size of the combustion chamber and reduce the compression ratio. The final thing you can do is modify your piston top. Now, in most cases, this means replacing the pistons, so it's not going to be as cost effective as machining or a head gasket change, but it's still going to be cheaper than a stroker kit, for example. If we assume that we start out with a flat top piston, then replacing this with a dished piston is going to increase cylinder volume and reduce the compression ratio, while replacing a flat top piston with a domed piston is going to reduce the cylinder volume and increase the compression ratio. So here's a little overview. And as you can see, the general rule is that anything that increases cylinder volume reduces the compression ratio, while anything that reduces cylinder volume increases the compression ratio. Now that we know what it is, how to calculate it, how to modify it, let's discuss choosing the optimal compression ratio for your application. Now doing this depends on three factors, how and what you're working with, what you want to achieve, and how hungry are you. 
First, let's discuss the how you're building your engine. And this mostly refers to the degree of accuracy you have incorporated in your build. So in other words, are you doing an enthusiast level build with lots of DIY, or are you having a professional shop with a proven track record of building motorsport winning engines do all the work for you? In general, increasing the compression ratio reduces the margin for error and demands greater accuracy. So for example, in my case, I have ground away material from my combustion chambers and increased their volume from 32 to 36.5 cc. Now, although I have done all of this manually, I have verified the volume and I have measured it afterwards and I have done my best to ensure that all the chambers are of equal volume. And although I'm confident that I managed a pretty reasonable degree of accuracy, none of this really compares, for example, to the accuracy of a CNC machine or the degree of accuracy professional volume measuring devices can achieve. So this means means that in my case, it's a good idea to leave a slightly larger margin for error. What you're working with refers to your hardware and more importantly your software. Again, let's take my build as an example. I have a 1.6 liter engine with 8.44 compression and I'm trying to achieve around 300 horsepower. Uh, to put this into perspective, the very popular RB26 and 2JZ engines have almost the same compression ratio and realistically the same power output. However, they have noticeably more uh, displacement than my engine. In other words, I'm trying to achieve the same power with the same compression compression ratio with almost half the displacement, which means that I'll be running a lot more boost than these engines did in their stock form. To be able to do this, I'll be running a standalone ECU, an AM Series 5 Infinity ECU, which has integrated knock monitoring and multiple engine protection strategies. Now, it's dramatically more capable and a lot more faster than the stock ECUs that the 2JZ and RB26 came from, which allows me to triple my horsepower output with a pretty reassuring degree of safety and reliability. In general, the stronger your hardware and the more capable your software, the better your knock control and the faster your ECU and the more engine protection options you have, the higher the compression ratio you can run. What you want to achieve are, of course, the goals of your build. For example, let's say that maximum horsepower is your absolute top priority on a boosted engine. In that case, you want to run the lowest compression ratio you can sensibly run. And this is because boost makes more power than compression. As a general rule of thumb, a single full point of increase in compression ratio is going to result in a 4% increase in power. In contrast to this, one PSI of boost increases power by around 7%. So if we take a 100 horsepower engine and increase compression from 9 to 1 to 10 to 1, which is a pretty substantial increase in compression ratio, we can expect the horsepower output to change to 104 horsepower. On the other hand, if we add 14 PSI around one bar of boost to that same engine without modifying the compression ratio, we can expect the new horsepower output to be increased by 98%. So with one bar of boost, you can practically double the horsepower output of the engine. However, all compression high boost engines tend to be a bit unresponsive or lethargic outside of boost. And then when the boost kicks in, it kicks in violently. So these engines can be uh, a bit challenging or even outright annoying to drive on the street or through the corners. So if horsepower isn't your top priority, but instead it's engine responsiveness, versatility, and fun factor on the street and through the curves, then I'd say you should aim for lower boost and higher compression. Now, if you want high boost and high compression, then you must ensure that the accuracy of your build as well as your hardware and your software is absolutely top notch, which sometimes simply isn't possible or practical for an enthusiast level build. In my case, I try to strike a middle ground. I want an engine that packs a pretty big punch, but I also don't want it to be absolutely horrible on the street. For example, if I was aiming for 500 horsepower from the same 1.6 liter engine, I would probably gone, have gone for a seven to one compression ratio. On the other hand, if I was aiming for around 200 horsepower with a smaller turbo, I would have gone for, let's say a 9.5 to maybe 9.8 compression ratio. Also, if I had a two liter engine and the same target horsepower level of 300 horsepower, I would again run higher uh, compression, let's say around 9.2 to 9.5 to one, because by having more displacement, I don't have to run as much boost to achieve the same horsepower output. If my build was naturally aspirated, then I would be running the highest possible compression ratio I could safely run with the build accuracy, knock control and fuel that I'll be using. And this is because with natural aspiration, a higher compression ratio doesn't have the potential downsides that it has on forced induction. In general, with natural aspiration, the higher you can run, the better. So in my case, that would be probably, I would be aiming for around 12.5 to one if I was naturally aspirated. 
The final factor is your hunger for power. If you're a power addict obsessed with straight line performance and you get bored of a power level quickly and always have the urge to increase boost just a little bit, then it's a good idea to future-proof the engine against yourself by leaving a bit more room for boost by running a lower compression ratio. Any special concerns? Well, I do have one, and that's my mid-engine application. And this isn't some modern hypercar mid-engine thing with giant intakes on the sides. It's a boxy 80s mid-engine car with a single tiny duct on the side. And although I can add ducting and work around this, inevitably having the engine in the back increases the potential to complicate intercooling and reduce its effectiveness and add overall heat to the system, which can increase intake air temperatures. So running a lower compression ratio also leaves some room for that. And there you have it, compression ratio, always a compromise. But I hope today's video helps you make the right choices to strike the best compromise for your application. As always, thanks all for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4H.